Hi, software engineers. Requirements, design, implementation, testing, and maintenance. It took me a second to hit that button. Maintenance. The fifth phase of software development, as we discussed from the very, very beginning during the software process lectures. Now, we've done your requirements for your project. We did some design. You've been coding this entire time. You've been testing this entire time. But maintenance is not something we're going to do a ton of with your project because you're not expected really to have a lot post release. But maintenance is probably the most important phase of software development. Why? Well, turns out the building of the software is only a small portion of what we care about when we talk about the actual lifetime of software. I mean, building it's obviously important. Figuring out what you want to build, figuring out how it's going to operate, how the customer is going to work with it, you know, what sort of value it brings to them, super, super important stuff. But then once it gets in their hands and they actually start using it, well, now this is where the rubber meets the road, right? Some pieces of software are in production for 10 years or more, uh, and they have to be updated against operating system changes, hardware changes, new features, bugs that are found. So it turns out maintenance is actually ridiculously important. Over three quarters of the cost of software comes during maintenance. Or another way to think about it is comes post-release. So we go about building the software and it costs, you know, X amount of money. And, you know, that, that's important. But then we have this long tail at the end of when the software is actually in use. So why? I mean, timeline is certainly part of it, but why? What do you think makes it so expensive? So why don't we pause? Think for a second, what contributes to the cost of software during that fifth phase? Still thinking? Are you done? You done? You sure? Okay. How about some obvious ones? Person hours are some of the most expensive things that any company ever has to pay for. If you look at the budget of a school, for instance, the person hours um, by far make up the largest part of a budget in many cases, uh, because not only are you paying for the salaries, you're paying for um, insurance, you're paying for um, overhead, you're, you're paying a lot of things. So when you pay for things like a help desk, whether that is just um, tech, uh, email support or if it's phone support, uh, it's expensive. This is why you see a lot of companies do things like calling a central phone bank, because what they do is they basically outsource their help desk to a company that's doing the help desk for a bunch of different software products. And then, you know, we can have a whole argument about the quality of that service, yada, yada, yada. But that is a big, big cost. Defects. If there's a defect in the system and if it, it turns into a failure, remember, remember, a uh, programmer makes a mistake that generates an error, which is the distance between the expected behavior and the actual behavior. That is a defect in the system, and it is a latent defect until it is executed by the, by the user, then it becomes a failure. So now we need to go in and fix those failures. Sometimes we're fixing failures, sometimes we're fixing defects. Those are different things, right? Fixing a defect means, ooh, I found something. I wonder if I can get it fixed before the customers notice. That's defect fixing, that's really good. You know, if you go in and you fix a bunch of bugs before a lot of people notice, that's great. You might have, if you ever peruse change notes for software, because I know you are just that into software. If you're ever perusing change notes, you often might see something like, you know, we fixed, you know, this particular bug. And you're like, how in the world did they ever figure that one out? Well, sometimes those test cases come in late and sometimes you figure them out. But a failure means that a user has documented this behavior and is probably complaining at this point. So how fast do you fix it? Um, you know, you probably want to fix it quick, depending on the severity of the failure and how much noise is being made, because you don't want the reputation of your company to be besmirched by poorly running software. So, uh, that's person hours, certainly to get that bug fix in that defect fix in. Uh, and then there's the cost of just getting it out to the, to customers, um, putting it through a certification process. Perhaps, um, you have to physically ship a patch. That's really old school nowadays, but that was a thing. I remember buying an update to DOS on a three and a quarter floppy drive. Yes, I'm that old. Um, that's a thing. New features. You want to be able to give more value to your customers. You've probably used a piece of software and they're like, hey, version 1.2, here's the new features. Like, 
oh whoa this is amazing it's like a whole new piece of software and the new features came in this is amazing you want that feeling why do you want that feeling it creates goodwill for your company it creates goodwill for your team it makes it seem like hey these people care about this piece of software and they're going to be supporting it into the future so the normal development process that you do through the first four phases of development it keeps going once you've released you often have more loops more cycles software development is iterative it's iterative not you're you're never done you're you're never done you're always having to go in and make changes and updates and things like that so new features for all the reasons i already stated for defect fixes for failure fixes how do you get it out to customers how do you document it how do you test it those person hours cost a lot of money changes in the environment and i don't mean that you know sea levels rising that sort of changed environment i mean do you remember when ios updated and they said no more 32-bit apps and all of a sudden some of the apps that you really enjoyed playing like that old flappy bird clone that you've been using forever suddenly stopped working because now it said that all apps had to be 64-bit i mean i lost quite a few games on my iphone um due to this which still bums me out a little bit not that i'm necessarily going to go back and play those but still i through games and i paid for them i wanted to still have them but this is a thing operating systems change hardware changes it might be that you have written some software for an, an atm an automated teller machine this was a thing i interned at wachovia back before it was bought by wells fargo yes again that's how old i am anyway we had a room we had every atm in it well a version of every atm in it and you got to install software and that was super cool by the way but you know, sometimes things would change in those machines. Physically would change. New buttons, new layouts. And when the environment changes, you'd have to update your software. The business needs change. It could be that your company has decided that you need to redirect the software into doing something slightly different. Um, this is not going to necessarily happen with, you know, Microsoft Word. But if you're building a piece of software that is more of a a business solution, something that's supporting a business activity. So for instance, something like the software that plans out a route for a UPS driver or something like that. Maybe something has changed in the world that means that that algorithm needs to change. So it's a business need change. And then there's all the documents you have to change. Yes, manuals do exist. You may not have read any. There used to be printed manuals, I remember. Again, back in the day of getting the manuals for video games, and that was always a very, very exciting thing to read on the way home from the Toys R Us, which is no more. Man, this is just, I'm just depressing myself today. Anyway, so uh, you gotta keep us old guys um, still operating, I suppose. But, so you, you, um, you, you still have the help menus and pieces of software, and you still have the documentation in the software that, you know, the help, the tool, tool tips, those sorts of things. Those all have to be changed too. There's a lot of things that when you update software has to change or that you have to keep supporting. The costs are huge. Three quarters of software development cost after release, not during development. And it's a shame that, that we give the term maintenance to the maintenance phase. Well, why do I say that? Maintenance sounds not fun. I mean, I'm just being honest, right? You think of maintenance, you're like, oh, something's broken. I have to fix it. There's nothing new and creative to do here. There's just cleaning up the mess that was in there before I'm doing maintenance. It's, it's not. Now, yeah, there's something glamorous about being in what's called greenfield development, where it's, you know, the sky is open and I can build whatever I want and I add the new features and things like, yeah, okay, that's, that's all well, fine and good. That doesn't mean that doesn't exist during the final phase. That doesn't exist during post-release. I just said that one of the main things you can do during post-release is ship new features. Ship new features that delight your current user base and make them want to buy the next version, that make them want to be a customer that goes to someone and says, hey, have you checked these guys out? These guys and gals, they're putting together some just really, really nice stuff. So. What else we call it? Software evolution? Kind of means other things. The improvement and modification phase? Eh. Life cycle support? That sounds like it's going to die. So we'll stick with the term maintenance for now. Um, post, I don't know. There isn't really a good one. But 
it's really important for you to know software is a living thing. And you don't just write software and then there it is. You don't. If you do that, that one, that's a very, very particular type of software. It's something where you don't expect that thing to ever change. I mean, this could be an instance where it's, I have built a, an artificial heart, like, you know, a medical device and it will never change. Th this particular thing will never change and the software never change. I mean, now you're making assumptions that there's no bug. Really hope there aren't in that instance, but you, you, you're assuming that it is a package deal. I mean, most software that you use now is something that evolves and changes and grows as time goes on. Software is released in beta forever now. And then eventually it, it, you go back to, you know, it's, oh, it's 1.0 release where it, it's like, yeah, I've been, I've been using that for years. The first version is rarely the right version. The first version is the version you get out in order to get to market and get your foot in the door. There is a really fine line. There, there's a whole practice around how much testing do you do? How many features do you have? When is the right time to release? How many features do we hold back intentionally so that people are getting more value later on? Kind of the DLC mentality. Hopefully you're not making people pay for it. But again, the monetization is a whole other argument here. It's not, we're no longer in the world of, I'm going to make software, press it on, on DVDs, and put it on a, a shelf in the Best Buy. I mean, that happens. But that's not the reality now of most software that we, that, that we buy now, right? It's not. It's not. Software is a changing, growing thing. Take this instance. Uh, you have a custom software hardware product. It costs two million bucks to develop. That's actually pretty low, but let's just roll with it. Problems have arisen. The custom hard disk, which all the data has stored, has run out of room. Ugh. The company that built the original disk is no longer in business. Oh, that stinks. You could buy from a new vendor but to make it work. Use an adapter pattern. All that stuff about patterns. It makes maintenance easier when you can look at a, a solution and say, oh, this is MVC. I know how to fix it. See, things link together. It's really great. Um, and the original devs have left the company. So you have new devs trying to come in and make sense of everything. This is a hard problem. This is a hard problem. Because it's all the phases. You have a new or modified requirement. You have a need for doing new design. How's the new, how's the pattern going to work? How's this new interface going to work? You have to implement it. You have to test it. You have to push the change out. And now you have to do maintenance on your new change into the future. Basically, if you are in maintenance, you have to be good at the entire development life cycle. So to think that, oh, I got put on maintenance, that's, that's not the mindset you want to have, right? The, the, there is this stigma that when you are doing maintenance on software, it's somehow the lowest rung of the ladder of the company. Don't get in that mindset. Yeah, okay, you think I want to be on the new product. I want to build the greenfield. I want to try new things. That doesn't mean you can't do that on existing products, right? So, you know, developers that have a lot of oomph in the company might say, no, I need to be the lead designer on the new piece of software. and Let's put the newbies on the maintenance and things like that. Which, by the way, is not necessarily a bad thing, not only from the, 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 the perspective of, uh, well, more from the perspective of you get to get your hands dirty with an existing code base that the company is using. So that, that's really important for you to know. But there is this cultural problem in development teams that maintenance is bad. That maintenance, is not, not bad to do, but it's like, ooh, you got put on the maintenance team. Um, but it's really an important job really, really important. Um, it's critical to have institutional knowledge, knowledge about the system. You have to be able to work with the customers. You have to be able to work with the other developers, the testers. You need to be able to read documentation. You need to be able to look at those UML diagrams and understand what's going on in the system. You need to be able to look at an existing code base, grok it, figure out how it's operating, then figure out, okay, this is where I need to go in and make the tweaks to make this working again. It's a really, really creative, interesting skill set, even if it might not feel as glamorous. So what some companies do is they do this kind of round robin maneuver where you, you'll be on the maintenance team for a while for existing products. 
um, and then you'll move to Greenfield, and then you kind of hop around. Um, it, it really varies by place, um, but it's a way of making sure that everyone gets to see all the code and is versed in all of the systems when all is said and done. So now let's talk about the types of maintenance that are out there. Corrective, perfective, and adaptive. We can look at any given type of change to software and put it into these categories. Corrective is the obvious one. Corrective means I'm fixing a fault or, or defect, right? So this could be something like I found a defect in the code, a failure was found in the code, a security flaw was found in the code, something was mistyped in the documentation. That is a corrective bit of maintenance. I'm not changing any behavior. Let me rephrase that. I'm not changing any intended behavior in the system. The, the feature set is the same. All I'm doing is I'm going in and making sure it does still work. Perfective is I am intentionally changing the, the feature set in one category, which is I am adding new features. I am adding value to the customer. I am, I am improving the software. The second version of perfective is no changes, which is refactoring. So if you go into a, a code base and you see that the variable names are terrible, and you decide to go in and change all the variable names to something that's easier for people to understand to perform better maintenance later, that is perfective maintenance for the purposes of the developers to better perform maintenance in the future. So for perfective, we have changes, perfective maintenance that changes functionality and adds value to the customer, adds new features, or we have perfective that adds value to the developers, which is improving the code base to make it easier to work with in the future. And finally, there's adaptive. Adaptive maintenance is when we have a piece of software and because of a change to the environment the software is running in, the software has to change. So operating system upgrade, um, new, new, uh, new version of a library that you depend on, new hardware that you depend on, those are all adaptive. Now, this is not adaptive. If, I don't know, a professor comes to you and says, you can't use SQLite in your project, you have to use Postgres. And so you have to go in and change your software from using SQLite to Postgres. That is not adaptive. Yes, you are making a change based, you're making an environment change, but this is actually, I mean, this is, prop, this is corrective from this perspective, from my perspective, because there is a, a requirement that you had to do one thing. It's so now you're changing to something else that, that you're, you're fixing a problem. Um, on some level, you could argue it's perfective because you're improving it for later, but it's really corrective, not adaptive. Adaptive is not a change. The customer says, oh, you need to make a change um, so that the software is um, usable by people who are colorblind. I'm like, oh, well, I'm making a change to make it a, a, you know, adaptive for other people. That's not adaptive. That's corrective in that instance because you are fixing a, a bug effectively. Adaptive is something has changed underneath the software, the operating system, the network, a library, the hardware, and you have to react to that to make your software continue to operate. Okay, So corrective is fixing problems. Perfective is adding value either to the customer or to the developer. Adaptive is I, I need to now, I, I need to make changes so I can keep operating. And then how do you reconcile these versions with people? Well, version numbers look like this, x.y.z, and then sometimes there's like a giant number at the end. Go to any piece of software that you have and go see if you can find these numbers. Um, the x is the major version, the Y is the minor version, and the Z is the patch version, bug fix version. And if there's a number after it, we tend to call that the build version. So the major version deals with architecture. Typically, when you go to a new major version number, you have changed something fundamental about the way the software works. You might have changed the engine of a game. You might have moved to a new platform. You might have completely rebuilt some part of it or change the UI so it's not even recognizable. It looks fundamentally different. 
So you tend to see a major version number change when something significant happens, where you're not necessarily guaranteeing continuity between versions. The Y is the minor version change. We typically see a Y number change when there is perfective maintenance for the customer. So when a new feature set comes out, a new patch with new, with new cool stuff, you tend to see to go to version 1.1, 1.2. The software is the same piece of software, which is why the one stays in the major version slot. But by incrementing that minor version slot, you're saying this is a demonstrably newer, better version of the 1.0 piece of software. Whereas when you go to 2.0, now you theoretically have a brand new system, a brand new architecture, brand new user interface, yes or no. I mean, these are all implemented to different degrees with different companies, but this is the general idea. The Z number, the bug fix number, the defect, the patch number, those tend to come out when the software, like you would not notice a change. So if you go from 1.10, 1.1.0 to 1.1.1, theoretically, you should see no changes. Other than the software doesn't fail in some states now. Um, you are, when you increase that Z number, you are now just up, updating existing functionality. So you're fixing bugs, right? And then that last thing, which you don't always see, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, it's just this long number off the end. Sometimes there's a B in front of it, sometimes not. Think of this like the commit ID number in GitHub. So the build number basically says, this is the you know 4,923rd build of the software. And it could be that when you actually go to the next version, the next is, is now 5,000 something because you had to have a ton of builds in between incrementally working up until finally you're like, no, this is the one I want to release. So build numbers never go up incrementally to the user. They will go up incrementally to the developer, even if some of them are literally just throwaway. So it could be you see something like, hey, I'm running 1.1.2 and um, you know, performing maintenance, you're trying to perform maintenance on it. And then the developer might say, could you give me the build number? And that will tell them exactly which branch of the code you have um, that you're working on. Now it's, it's rare, very rare, that companies, you know, have multiple versions of the same major minor bug out with different build numbers. It can happen. Um, it's pretty rare, but that's what you're looking at when you see those numbers. How does maintenance start? It often starts with the defect report, whether that is new development or bug fixes or something like that. There's usually some form of documentation that's going to get the ball rolling somehow. So for instance, here's a very, very simple one. Uh, this meme generator defect. So this is some sort of um, app that allows you to generate meme images. Um, it has a defect ID because you need to be able to reference it in the system. You often might want to reference the defect ID in any commits uh, in GitHub. So there's traceability between the bug report, the defect report, the feature report, um, and what's happening. Um, you have an overview. You need to have some sort of explanation of what the expected result is, uh, some information about what the environment is, what's the severity, you know, how, how important it is to fix this bug, who's it assigned to, priority. You get that sort of information of it. So this is kind of how things have been done for a very, very long time. And there would often be, I mean, you could have a PDF like this, but you could also have a piece of software like Bugzilla was a very popular one for a long time. Um, U-Track is the one that uh, the folks who build PyCharm, JetBrains, that's theirs that they, that they put together for, for tracking this sort of thing. Um, as much traceability as you can have is a good thing. If you can trace a defect to a feature, like a feature request in the original documentation, to a, uh, to a commit in your source control, that's pretty powerful because then you can really get a handle on what parts of your system need the most maintenance, how, you know, how to allocate your resources, that sort of thing. But uh, the defect or the change is reported by some stakeholder. It's investigated by a developer to, to figure out what's going on. Eventually a patch is created, the patch has to be tested, and then some sort of change request has to be processed. Now, in the long, long ago in the way back time, uh, when I was at Wachovia, a change request required a signature from a VP. 
which sounds a lot more impressive than it actually was. I mean, there were lots of VPs at the time and no one really looked at what I was doing. Now you have a pull request. And we'll talk about those in just a moment. So I want you to think for one second though, what are some things you can do to make maintenance easier? So imagine you're building software and you wanna make sure that whoever's gonna to be touching your code in the future has a little bit easier job of trying to do stuff. What are some things you can do? Pause again, take a moment, write them down if you like. What are some things you can do to make maintenance easier for other people? You got some stuff? Have you undone the pause? You still there? Have you turned it off? Here's some thoughts. How about we document our code? Now you don't document everything. We talked about this early on in implementation. You don't want to write documentation for literally every method that you have, because then if you have to change the code and you forget to change the documentation, you now have created a new defect and ugh. But it's good to have a, doc, a, a, a comment block at the top of a file that kind of explains what the file is doing. It's good to have what we would call self-documenting code. So the methods and the variables all have good names. It makes it obvious what they're doing. Um, if you have a method that requires a little bit more thought, something that's really critical to your algorithm, you go in and take a look at that and really look at it and you know document that a little bit better. But you know, good documentation. Follow code conventions. If your language is camel cased, use camel case. If your language uses underscores, use underscores. If you're supposed to tab things and space things a certain way, do that. You might think, oh my gosh, why do I have to do the fight the fight the power? I'm gonna write the code the way I want to. It can compile any way I want. Well, okay, yeah. But it's the same reason when you write an essay to turn into some to an English professor, you don't write the whole blessed thing in caps lock and in bold and right justified. I mean, sure, it can be read, but it's annoying. Don't do it. You want people to be able to look at your code and quickly and easily and without frustration understand what you're doing. If you write code and you don't follow the code conventions, two things are gonna happen. One, the person is, is going to get very frustrated Probably not going to think very highly of you as a developer. Like, how did this person write this? And the likelihood of the bug getting fixed goes down. Now, unless you're actively participating in corporate espionage, not sure why you would want. So, next, use design patterns. This is one of the reasons why we like design patterns. On the front end, it makes it easier for you to build the solution. If you look at something and say, this is visitor pattern, I know how this works, you build things accordingly. When someone goes in to fix that, they go, this is visitor pattern. And they understand the architecture without having to be, you know, led through it. Clear communication. It all comes back to clear communication. If, if I can look at your software and understand it quickly, that's just great. People will think of you as a better developer. People will be able to better support your code. Everyone's happy. Everyone's happy. So don't uh, don't over design, but also don't under design. I know this is kind of a weird category here, but it's one of these things where, you know, if you have the fruit inventory system for the fruit commission, I will design a system which fruit is an abstract class and can be expanded into all kinds of fruit. Okay, that sounds fun. Um, there aren't really that many fruit that are grown in this particular region of the world. Just saying. So yeah, it can be a little bit extendable, do you, but do you need like, I will make a tree fruit and I will make a berry fruit. You're overdoing it. The unders design is there are seven fruits that we grow. That is it. I will have seven columns, one for each column of each fruit. That's just bad design. There's a happy medium here. I'm not here to tell you what the right happy medium is for your fruit software, but you get the idea, hopefully, that you're, you're trying not to make software that is completely locked down to one thing, but also you're not trying to make it so that it's infinitely reconfigurable. You know, keep it simple, um, but not too simple. Modern software maintenance now exists in the form of pull requests. <laughs> um, 
software development has moved so much into the tools around source control development, source control maintenance, uh, uh, source control, just in general, that uh, pull requests are the modern defect report, uh, feature request issues in GitHub uh, is how things are tracked. And one positive of this is it keeps it all in one system and there's easy traceability between the code, the commit, the feature, the issue, the pull request, um, which allows some really interesting uh, analytics on the software about how things are operating. So inside a company, you might uh, write some code, issue a pull request to a senior developer. The senior developer th theoretically looks over the code and then approves the pull request, let it come into the system. Uh, maybe you get into a position where you have the ability to approve pull requests from other developers on certain aspects of the system. In open source development, there tends to be a core team that manages, that has final say over what goes into the open source project. And everyone is invited to fork the code, do whatever you want to with it, build new features. But then they'll have pretty strict requirements on accepting a pull request. Uh, in those instances, it could be something like, you need to have tested it this much. You need to show what the features are. You need to, you know, you need to prove that this is worth the time. So that's a quick overview of kind of how maintenance works. What's, what's really important to remember is that maintenance is effectively all of software development wrapped into its own time frame post the first release, right? Software is an evolving, growing, changing thing. And we should leverage that. We should understand that we have the ability to release patches. We have the ability to release new features. We have the ability to support software beyond that initial release. So once you get into that maintenance phase, the software is out there, people, people are using it, it becomes this really interesting dance back and forth of requests for new features, or here's a defect request, or um, the operating system has changed. How do we fix that? It's you're spinning a lot of plates at one time, trying to make sure that you are providing as much value as possible to the stakeholders of the software. So greenfield development, that initial, hey, we're gonna do the first version. This is gonna be awesome. I can't wait to release it. That's exciting. That's not the heart of what it means to be a software engineer at the end. Because at the end of the day, you have to make sure that that software continues to give value to people well into the future. So I hope this helps. I hope this is um, giving you some insight as to kind of how maintenance works. Great seeing you as always. I'll see you next time. Bye.